Hello, my name is Melody Munch and I am a second grade teacher in Oklahoma. Welcome to a video all about how we do math groups in second grade. Now, math groups is not something I've done all eight years of my teaching. I believe I started math groups year three or maybe year four, but I wish I could say I did it the entire time. It used to be something in my first year of teaching that we did only on Fridays. It was like a fun Friday. And I remember even then being like, oh my gosh, we just love math groups. The kids love these rotations and they looked forward to it every week. And I don't know why I didn't think to make it a part of every single day because it really is such a great way to get the kids practicing their math, but in a really fun way. And what I love about it now is that it really helps me fine tune my instruction for what each of my students need. So first let me tell you about the general idea of math groups and then I'll show you some resources that I use and what a typical day of math groups looks like. So for me, math groups started really out of necessity. I previously would teach a whole group math lesson and then assign the students their independent homework or not homework, but their independent work for the class. So their work that they were gonna do on their own. And then I would come sit at my table like this and they would get in a line and they would show me their work and I would circle what they needed to fix and have them come back and keep checking with me until everything was good to go and then they would put it away and they would have a few options like math games they could do while they were waiting for other peers to finish. But then this one year, I had a lot of students who kept doing their independent work incorrectly. Like it wasn't just like a handful of students. It was like a good chunk of students and they needed reteaching. And so I used to say like, okay, if you're, you know, if you're struggling, you can come sit at my table, we'll do some together. But it was just so many students that it was really hard to fine tune the instruction to meet their needs because there'd be a whole line of students waiting to be checked. So I always felt bad, like they were wasting their class time standing in line. Things would get rowdy because they're just standing there waiting on me. So I'd hate to make students wait, but I would be trying to really help one student quickly understand what they didn't understand because their work was wrong and then they'd end up having to sit at my table and they'd have to wait on me more because I was trying to check the kids that were ready. So we were kind of doing math groups, but just not well because we were doing the wait in line. Oh, you need extra help. Come sit at the table. Now you wait, let me check everybody else. Now we can help you. So it just became this really bad rhythm in my classroom. So I decided to split my kids into group for each groups for each unit. And I used their pretest of the unit data to determine what group was their best fit. So if they were scoring in the highest bracket, they were grouped together. If they were in the middle, they were grouped together. And if they were scoring the lowest that they needed the most support, they were grouped together. The students' groups were fluid. They could end up in different groups along the way, depending on how well they did on their pretests. And I grouped them. And then what we did every time is I would teach the whole group lesson at the board. So everybody's doing that part together. We're practicing, they're getting introduced to the skill we're working on. And then we would split instead of doing independent work, we would split to math groups. So that has been a game changer for my class. My students love it. I love it. And it's really allowed me, like I said, to work more one on one with the students that need it. So the layout of my math groups works as such. First round, I always have my students that need the most support start with me at my teacher table. And that is just because round one, we usually take the longest because I am scaffolding and supporting those students that need more support more. So we're gonna do more together where they're watching me. And then we're gonna do some where I do a part of it, they finish it. Or we're gonna do some where you do it and then we check it together. So we're going slower in that first round. So that group is always doing their independent work at my table. And sometimes they might have a smaller requirement of work to get done because that's where they're at, that's what they need. 
So maybe instead of doing 10 problems on their own, they're only doing four on their own. That way it's more manageable for them because we've done more together. Or sometimes if we just don't have time, then just the expectation of how many problems they do might be different in my round one. But I try to give them the most time. I try to give that round the most time because those are the students that I really need to reinforce the math concepts with. Then we switch and my middle group will come to the table. They need a lot less from me, so we might review a couple things. They go for it. Sometimes I just let them go for it. And then if I realize, mm, hang on, we're not all quite ready, then we'll stop and regroup and do some together. And then they go for it. And every group, they check with me when they're done and then they can go start their next round a little early if they're finished. So usually the group that leaves my table always goes to technology so they can get on their technology a little early if they finish before the round is up. That's the second group. And then the third group is my highest learners who probably already could do the math independently. So they come, they do the math, they check with me. That's pretty much it. I usually don't go over anything with them. And sometimes in that round, I'm just supporting around the room and then come back and circle to check on them. Or sometimes I'm offering extension problems. So extra step ahead problems or extra problems that the other groups didn't do to support those learners with what they need. And sometimes we'll play a math game if they are finished early since they would have been the last group to come. They would have already done the technology rounds. So they don't need to go back for more. So sometimes we'll play an additional game that I can show you as a group. So that's kind of the system that I've used. It's worked beautifully. I found that when we do a post assessment, my learner scores are so much more even across the board. It used to be that some students did really well, some were in the middle and some were lower, but now it's like so much more consistent that they all do well, not every student gets 100%, but there's a lot more of that regardless of what group they're in because they're getting the time and support they need in math groups to all be able to be successful on the post-test. Now let's look at what all three of the stations looked like. I told you about kind of what we do at the teacher table, but we'll talk about what each of them usually looks like. They do change sometimes, but Typically, I like to stick with something familiar and simple, so I'll show you what that looks like. So this would be a very typical round one situation when it's time for groups after we've done our whole group, which typically students all come to the carpet during whole group with their math book and we do the part that's whole group together on the board or I'll do some, they try some, that type of thing, but we're just doing it as a class more because I know that I'm gonna be able to fine tune the instruction once we're in groups. So this is more like a whole class introduction to the lesson. And then I will put up this slide. That means it is time for groups and their groups are pretty predictable unless we have started a new unit. Then sometimes I tell them, okay, there's gonna be some changes, but typically they all know where they start. The independent group is the group that comes to my table first. So it says group table. Then there's a group game that changes slightly, but typically that group is staying here on the carpet and plays a game either on the board or an actual board game that's math related. And then the last group is on a computer program. I love this program called Extra Math, so I'll show you that. And I have those students sit over in the library area just so that we're all kind of spaced out. So I've got my group, I've got the computer group, and I've got the game group here on the carpet. So let's talk about the computer game group options that we use a lot. These are the three games that I have that are all from Lakeshore Learning. They don't sell them at this time on their website, but I've been able to get them their actual CDs. So you do need a way to install them. If your district has like a laptop, you'll have to get something like an extension port to put that into your computer or if you have a regular desktop, you can do it that way. But I found them on Amazon for like $3 from various sellers, and I think you pay a couple dollars of shipping, or you might be able to find them on eBay. They are totally worth it. And I have one on place value, money, and telling time, which are all great second grade skills. They have more, like I think they have fraction ones for older grades, but these are the ones that our school resource room already had, so I made sure to install all three of those. This is probably the favorite, so we'll pick that one. It does have sound, but I usually mute it during groups because it just can be distracting for the other 
kids otherwise. But typically the group that's here will all come sit on the carpet or they're allowed to sit on the desks here. And they wait for me to call on them to determine the teams because that's usually the only arguments we have at group game is like who's going first. For this game, I could let them just decide, but typically it's easiest for them just to get quiet and sit on the carpet. And then I will pick someone quiet to decide if they would like a teammate or if they would like to go alone, depending on how many kids are in the group. And then they get to start the game. So it's gonna, it's gonna give you all the noises, but just keep in mind, typically those are off. We usually play with four teams because there's usually seven to eight kids in the math group. And depending on how much time we have, we usually play with one dice to make it last longer. If we're short on time, we might play with two. Welcome to be the first to find the golden numbers in the mystery house to win. Okay, so this is the setup of the game. I would call on a student to either pick a partner or if there was few enough kids, they could go alone. They come up and roll the dice. It moves for them, which I love, so there's no like argument about that, and they solve the problem. So this is expanded form. We have definitely talked about this quite a bit. They would pick their answer, and it checks for them. Great job, detective. I believe in this game, if they get it wrong, it sends them back to the space they started on, like to the space they were on before. Then the next player goes, sometimes, there's like a trap door situation where they go back or there's a secret passage where they get to move up. It just depends. So this is another question they might have. We also talk about using base 10 blocks. So this is a great second grade related problem. So those are a thousand blocks. So 2000, one, 10, one, one. Great job, detective. Yeah, so see that noise might get a little bit annoying if you were doing it. But that is the basic premise of the Mystery House game. They absolutely love this one. Here is the money one, just so you can kind of see for reference. This is always a little bit hard for my second graders because we don't spend a lot of time on counting money. And a lot of the counting money units that we do are at the end of the year. So we usually go for less coins unless it's my Let's high group. Four gold coins to win works the exact same way. So we pick the teams, they roll the dice, they move. Now- Use the pencil tool or drag <laughs> coins from the bank to help you solve the problem. Then select an answer and press check answer. Okay, so you'll notice that I do have an interactive smart board. However, you really don't need that if you have a computer that connects to your board. I've also played at a different school where the one team member, like the teams are usually two members, and one team member would be at the board solving, and the other team member would go to the computer and click the answer. That wouldn't be ideal for this classroom because the computer is pretty far away from the board, and I'm sitting at the chair with my group, so <laughs> that would be a little bit annoying so this is definitely something that would be beneficial if you have a interactive board i have had students play on like an actual personal laptop before but it just doesn't have the same i don't know what to say engagement probably because it's not as big and on the whiteboard they just love getting to touch the board so we'll go ahead and solve this problem so a dollar 25 and quarters okay i'm gonna have to actually think so 30 35 40 dollar 44 Good thing that was an answer. That would have been embarrassing. Oh, look at us. Okay, so you get the idea. And then I'll just show you the time one just for fun so that you can see it. They collect cheese for the little mouse. Collect four pieces of cheese to win. This one, I feel like they always get stopped by this cat and it takes away a piece of their cheese. <laughs> but they really love this one. They've done really well. It has, oof. Sheesh. I forget it has this many noises. Um, typically the questions are doable, but there's a few questions about like quarter hour that my students aren't super familiar with. 
I don't think it does any a.m. and p.m. questions. It's mostly just reading the clock and sometimes it'll say quarter hour. I don't think it does elapsed time either that I recall. So, okay, just pick the time. Okay, so those are math games on the board. But we're not always using math games on the board. Sometimes I do just love a traditional board game, especially to reinforce addition and subtraction skills. So I'm going to show you some of my favorites now. So this is Sum Swamp, and it is a class favorite. I love having the kids play on individual teams instead of them having to share a team. I feel like they're just a lot less engaged when they share teams. So my school already had one and I ordered a second one that is a newer version, but it's actually the exact same game. And we just keep all the pieces in one of these containers because they seem to get lost otherwise. And it's really simple, but really fun. The game works like this. There are four characters. So um, eight students could play if you have two board games. And like I said, typically our math groups have seven to eight students per group. So if you have a bigger class, if you're one of those very, very special people that has like 30 students in your class, which I think is insane and Lord bless you, then you could either get like a third one of these or you could have like and play different math games that weren't all the same as that game. So they roll three dice. So two of the dice are number dice and one of the dice is what we call the operations dice that has addition and subtraction symbols. So a plus or minus symbol. They roll it. I got four minus two, so I would move two. And then what's fun is that the game has different spaces that say even, odd, and then there's also some spaces that have a number on them. So I'll show you on the new version as well, since I don't think you could probably find this old one unless it's on eBay. So it's the same game. It's just set up as a different board, but same thing. If I got a two, I would land on evens. And if I land on evens, then I would roll just one of the number dice. And if I get an even number, I can move forward that amount. If I don't, if I get an odd number, I just stay there. I got a one, so I would stay. There's also the numbered, the numbers spaces, like this space has a two. If I landed on that space at the end of my turn, then I would roll the operation dice. And if I get a plus sign, I'm moving forward to. If I get a minus sign, I move back to. I got a minus, <laughs> back into start. So really fun, really simple, just practicing adding and subtracting fluently. The only tricky part about group games is that sometimes there is disagreement. So we do really try to go over the rules at the beginning and talk about what we can do to solve a problem like not accusing someone and saying you're cheating because that usually doesn't feel good to hear so usually talking about the rules and reminding one another not touching one another's pieces because that can be frustrating so there are some things to go over with that and depending on the kind of mix of students that you have you might have this go really well every single time or you might have some students that just it's not a great fit for and they might need an alternate thing to do if playing a group game is stressful or frustrating for them. So it's just something to keep in mind. It's worked really well for most of my students, but there have been occasional groups that just every time we're really struggling to play well together. And so typically the game on the board was a little bit smoother sailing for those types of groups of students. But sometimes I just would switch out the group game for independent work. If that group was just, they could not play well together, then just they do another independent work page instead, like an extra practice page, instead of getting to enjoy the game until they could handle it. So just options for you. Another part about this game is it has this endless loop where they have to keep going around until they land on the exit spot. So that can be kind of fun because it allows players to kind of catch up to one another. Once they land on the exit spot, then in their next turn, they can continue towards the final path to the end of the game. So that is a go-to. I love that it's really easy to learn how to play and that the students enjoy playing it every time. So some swamp is another group game option for that station so we store our math games in here i will be sure to link the some swamp game for you and outside of that that's really our go-to outside of that this pop to win game that's more of a 
overall second grade math review has been really good. It does have some word problems and not all of my students are super fluent readers yet, so it doesn't work as well as an independent choice for everyone, but my higher group of students often likes that. This game is basically some swamp, but with a space theme, so that is another good one that we pull out. I also have two sets of that inside that box. The first box kind of wore out, so those are really our go-tos. The other ones are more occasional things. I think that's just recess games. So those are other good options. The other group game option that I particularly use a lot at the beginning of the year are card game options, which there are so many games you can do just for fun. We'll use the big cards, but I also just have little individual sets of cards here. So I'll show you how we play this one. One of the main games that we play with the cards is called Addition Top It, or you could also make it Subtraction Top It, and it works very simply like this. If you have two players, two players each draw two cards, and they add them up. So this player, we say face cards are worth 10, just to keep it simple. This player would have 16. This player would have nine. We call aces one. And so this player that has 16 has topped the other player. They have more in their number. So the player that has less gives away their cards. And these are now that player's point pile. Then they go again. This player has eight. This player has eight. Oh, this is perfect. So if there's a tie situation, we go just like sudden death where we just go until there's a winner. So they draw two more cards. Ooh, they got 17. I just, maybe that, that should be that player's card. 17 and 10. Okay, so 17 would win. They get all the cards. Okay, so they just play till they run out of cards and then they would count their points and see who got more. You would also play it where they subtract the two numbers instead of adding them. And that would also work out the same way where they would just see who got a higher score or you could even play who got the lower score just to mix it up if you wanted but that is a really fun game i'll show you the second game but it requires a little bit of setup so let me set that one up and then i'll show you we just call this game make making 10 or make 10 and the players just take turn trying to make a match that would equal 10 and if they find a face card, we say that's an automatic 10 that they could take as a point in the game. So if I flip over a six, I'm looking to find a four, not quite. So if I don't find a match, I turn them back over. If we do find a match, I keep those cards and we replace them with new cards until the deck is gone or the time is up. So five, looking for a five, no. So the players are seeing the numbers and kind of looking for what would make a match? No. We're gonna keep playing until we find a match. Okay, we found a 10, automatic point, so we replenish that, and then that would be their turn. Oh, another automatic 10. Will we ever find a match? <gasps> I believe there was a three somewhere. Oh, I think it was here. Yes, so I would get that match we would replenish. So this is a great game, especially for the beginning of the year, just remembering how to make 10 and making 10 quickly would also be a great game for first grade, probably not for older grades, but maybe you could match to a higher number and they could draw three cards. There's one more math game I completely forgot to show you that my students love. So here's a clip about it from my Instagram. Teachers, here's a math game my students loved so much we had to replace the box. It's called Snap It Up. To play, each player gets five purple number cards. Their goal is to make an equation that will equal the black card in the middle. For example, seven minus five is two. You get the black card as your point, then you discard the cards you used in your equation and draw new ones. The game continues until you're out of cards and you see who can collect the most. If everyone gets stuck making the total, just draw another card until someone can make it work. This game is perfect for small groups and early finishers, and there's a phonics version. Last, I will show you what the computer station looks like. Often, it is starting with Extra Math, which is just a math fact practice website, and it does assess the students where they are at. So this guy usually gives them a progress quiz and they have to quickly solve 
the equations and try to be fluent and quick. It's going to go on for a while, so I'm probably going to stop here, but it is timed. So this student's working on subtraction. They start with addition. It progressively gets harder, and they can even go into multiplication. If you set that as the teacher in the setting, it is a free website, at least as of now. And then when they're done with that, or if it's Friday, I usually give them the option to do Prodigy Math, which they absolutely love. It is a gamified math world they have to battle other other characters and when they do they earn things and to battle they have to do some math problems there's also also a prodigy english version there they are that they can play on fridays in our classroom just so that we're not using too much computer time there are also great math games on a website called abcia but unfortunately, my students tend to get distracted by the non-math games on ABCA, and it was becoming a bit of a problem. So that is why we typically just do extra math or prodigy if they finish that. Just showing you a glimpse. Have um, absolutely no idea what any of this does, but I think we're about to battle. Okay. They typically have headphones on or they turn this off. Oh man, okay. I don't know if we're... Okay. Okay. Great. I'm so sorry to him if I mess something up. How do I cast this spell? I'm not really sure. Oh, I have to pick somebody. Let's pick them. Okay, obviously. Cast a spell. I... As you might have realized, I don't teach them how to play this. They figure it out quite quickly, though. Oh, do I click here? Oh, it's a math problem. Okay. How many shells did they collect together? Reva and Kayleen. And then it can also read to them. Reva and Kayleen are collecting shells at the beach. Reva okay. collected 13 and Kayleen collected 2. Okay. On their way back home. They found three more shells. Okay. How many shells did they collect all together? Okay, so Place they could the use the counters. The total. But I'm just going to enter the answer. Just kidding. We need to do this. What? Make sure you answer the question. Oh, okay. Okay, that took quite a while. So let's see if it will let me do it now. Oh, goodness. Excellent. Okay, so I was able to cast that... Bell. Do I pick someone? Magic Good work. Okay. You to cast more spells. Okay, cool. But do I pick them? Okay. Oh no, they hit me back. Okay, so that is the premise of Prodigy. They absolutely love it. Finally, let's take a look at what we do for independent work. This does always vary by curriculum, but I love using these dry erase sleeves. And our math paper that's independent work has to be printed off. It's not in their book. If it already is in their book, then you won't need to do this. So you agree that I'll save you more time. But I print off about a half class set of these and we just put it inside the sleeve, which I can show you in a minute, and then they can be erased so that the next group can use them and I don't have to print a full class set for them. My students bring an Expo marker back to the table with them, or you could just leave some back here at your table. And then my first group is well-versed in putting our math paper into the sleeve. I got these at Target. I've also seen them at Dollar Tree, or you could probably find them on Amazon as well and this person did not erase very well so we're gonna help them out <laughs> usually it's fine a magic eraser is what we use because a regular dry erase mar or dry erase eraser just does not quite do the trick it's really hard to erase thoroughly so i use magic erasers they do wear out after a while after they're very used <laughs> but they i would say they last maybe two months or so so i just have a set of those and then they come back and I will probably have one that I'm using and then they each have one as well. And we just go through the math and then when they're done, they show it to me and when it's good, I say, great, 
you may erase and I hand them an eraser. They erase it so it's ready for the next group. So that is how we do it. I also have teammates that just print out one paper for each student and they do it that way. Occasionally, if we're working on a skill that we rarely get to do, like telling time or counting money, I will change out the group game to be some kind of extra practice. So sometimes it's like doing a one or two pages of a math packet for the week, or sometimes it's a walk the room activity. We love those where it's task cards and they go to a task card and they write on the recording sheet their answer. The only struggle with that is that then I'm kind of having to check two things at once. So I'm checking the independent work and I'm having to check a packet or a walk the room activity. So that is why I typically prefer to keep that middle group as a game because it's not something that I need to check with them on. And so they can operate independently of me and I can focus on being here with the group. I hope you enjoyed taking a look at what our math groups for a typical day of school look like in second grade. I hope that the ideas are helpful to you and that you will give it a try in your classroom. If your experience is anything like mine, you will never want to go back and your students won't either. That is honestly something they tell me all the time. We just did a daily check-in today where they could put one thing they love doing in our classroom and a couple of them put things like class songs or recess, but the most popular answer was math groups. So I don't know if one person had the idea and they just all jumped on it, but math groups was on there like six times. So it got a lot of love and it's always evident why, because they run very smoothly. They're engaged the entire math block and they really get exactly what they need. A little bit of math fun practice on technology and at a game and then the independent help that they need at my station or enrichment. As a general time reference, our stations are usually about 20 minutes long. The first group is a full 20, and typically the other groups are around 15 minutes, sometimes less. So in all, I usually allow for about an hour or 50 minutes of time to get through all three of the groups. The way our schedule works this year, we do one group before we go to recess and lunch and the other two groups when we come back. So we had to split it up just to make it work with our schedule, but of course you could also do it all at one time as well. So that is a quick look at our math groups. Let me know if you have any questions and I'll try to link everything I can in the description below. See you next time. Oh, hey, see, how are you? <laughs> You're fine, I just finished. Okay. <laughs>